So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Nazif and I will present you my thesis entitled Violent Performance Analysis Using Weak Supervision. Uh, my thesis is supervised by Xavier Serra and in the committee, well, you all see them, Rachel Bittner, Lon Weiss and uh, Jose Javier Valero Mas. I will go over the title slowly. No, <laughs> okay. Uh, first, violin. You all know it due to its highly expressive nature and it's used in many music traditions. It is the staple of Western classical orchestra and also widely used in Turkish makam music and Carnatic music. Uh, despite its importance and uh, high prominence in many uh, traditions, violin, working for violin as an engineer comes with two specific challenges. The first one is violin is hard to label. And that is actually be, uh, coming from the reason that um, the, the, the same nature that makes it highly expressive, namely the fretless, bow, fretless fingerboard and the bow, makes it also very hard to label. Unlike uh, piano, where you can uh, collect labels through key presses and using digital instruments like this clavier, the same technologies cannot be applied for the analog and very complex sound production mechanism of the violin. And the second reason is the lack of in-domain data. Although previously the, the other uh, researchers introduced, uh, created data sets for the violin, these are uh, very small actually and uh, in terms of uh, domain fitting, it is very uh, simple and uh, in terms of repertoire, they are simple and uh, in simplistic in, uh, in virtuosity, basically. So I will highlight this uh, because this thesis actually addresses these two challenges. And performance analysis, uh, roughly, as you can guess, it is the analysis of music performances. And uh, generally this is done using four uh, analysis dimensions. These are timing, pitch, dynamics, and timbre. And uh, generally the application scenario for this um, research problem is expressive analysis of expressivity analysis regarding professional performances and performance assessment when it comes to student recordings. And uh, violin, being an important instrument, also has some violin-specific music performance analysis research. We see that the instrument nature actually uh, shapes the approaches in this domain, and we see lots of works on intonation and pitch accuracy, and also due to the hardship of controlling this bow, uh, lots of work also focus on bow technique recognition. And in our scenario, we specifically mean representation of performance details in real world scenarios. So this is my definition for performance analysis. And this thesis actually delivers some core technologies for this purpose. These are pitch estimation uh, due to the importance of the intonation and the high like fretless violin basically. Descriptive transcription where we try to transcribe performances into note events with onsets, offsets and pitch bends. And playing technique detection where we extend this notion, the, the notion of transcription into, into something that includes the details such as uh, legato and staccato. And in real world scenarios, what I mean is both solo setting, which is very prominent in home practices, for example, and accompaniment, which is uh, common. Actually, it is the norm when it comes to um, any audition or music exam. So we are expected to deliver good performances regardless of these scenarios. And lastly, with weak supervision, what I mean, again, my definition, is that this, these are low-cost strategies that do not require manual annotations. Uh, you will see these like uh, yellow badges when there is a weak supervision applied there to connect the dots. And here, the strategies that I, we applied is uh, pseudo-labeling where using an external machine learning algorithms output as automatic labels, random mixing, where we create these cacophony mixes out of, uh, out of things that doesn't mean anything like violin and piano mixes randomly, and um, expectation maximization, where we iteratively solve a problem by uh, adapting to the domain, I can say, like starting from rough, bad estimates, uh, slowly improving these uh, circles as you see here. And lastly, we also use audio score alignment as a means of uh, weak supervision, I can call. Uh, and that is basically transferring the, the annotations on the score to uh, audio recordings. So 
to sum up from the very beginning, this thesis um, creates, it has two main contributions. The first one is targeting the scarcity of in-domain data, where in-domain doesn't simply mean, oh, we introduce a di violent data set here. What I try to say here is we um, use the domain knowledge coming from real music education, and uh, we actually try to approach the real world settings in terms of acoustic and repertoire. And secondly, we target the difficulty of labeling the violent performance dimensions. And actually, this is a very common theme in, among all the other instruments, like unlike piano, like some of them have this nature. Uh, for target this difficulty of labeling, we introduce weekly supervised training strategies that do not require, um, that do not require annotations for training. So yes, we start now. <laughs> Uh, here you see like the chapters put into these uh, different uh, tasks that I mentioned. So chapter three deals with this data set and four, five, uh, six, and seven are about these weekly supervised training strategies. So let's start with the data set. Uh, the motivation behind this, as I explained briefly before, it's representing the practical needs of violent performance analysis. Um, as I mentioned again, violin constitutes a small section in the previous data sets. These are labor intensive data sets, which are very hard and costly to make. These are Bachten, Medley DB, and URMP. And there are also other data sets with violin tracks. But um, what is not, uh, wh why we need to intervene, why we need to improve here is that these data sets are generally simpler and popular and coming from popular repertoire. Again, it's because the researchers doesn't address the, dim the dimensions that we want to target and uh, they do not match the virtuosity required for educational and professional performance analysis purposes. And we also have a second bigger ambition, and that is doing something towards bridging the gap between education and technology. And uh, for this purpose, we actually draw inspiration from how do we learn, how I learned the violin actually, and uh, build uh, some algorithms relying on string pedagogy and the domain knowledge in teaching instruments so some background and pedagogical material. String pedagogy has a rich tradition of educa educational material aimed at addressing unique challenges associated with string playing. These are treatises um, which are instructional guides explaining how to play this instrument with pictures and also ex textual expressions. Uh, even Mozart has written one. And we have study materials Roughly, I can say these are these constitute etudes and, and scale books. Etudes are uh, composition, compositions uh, that also have some musical value, but uh, mainly created for technical development. And the scale books are basically some studies which do not have some su such high musical value. So examples for this are Shreddick uh, scale book and uh, Rode etudes. And lastly, we have Suzuki method. Uh, this is a very prominent educational approach, I can say. Um, this is a pedagogical approach, although originated in violin, it is actually widely used in many instruments. Uh, the approach relies on early exposure and tradition of reference recording. So every Suzuki book is accompanied by a CD of the old times that uh, showcase the, how this, this score should be played for the students to imitate. But basically, this tradition of recording these reference performances stayed in violin education. And today, we have um, the violin educators often record etudes and other education repertoire, and which is also a rich source when it comes to um, our perspective as engineers. So this thesis, the, the material, almost all the material that we use in training the algorithms in this thesis comes from this domain. And the main focus of this data set is etudes. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is technical compositions with musical value. These are widely used in string pedagogy, a rich technical range. Uh, they're ordered by difficulty, so they are actually important for other applications in computer-aided music education. Uh, these are all public domain scores because they come from um, late romantic period most of the time. And they have these diverse recording conditions. And also, if you search Google Scholar, you can actually find lots of analysis from, um, from the people that actually study uh, violin performance PhDs 
uh, in, in explaining like how you should use them in technical education. Um, outside its youth status, it also includes public domain part of the Suzuki method, meaning the, the ones that do not have uh, uh, any restrictions in the sharing. Um, and these are, again, classical music. And uh, also sonatas from Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. Uh, in terms of sharing the data set, uh, we shared them, the, the performances via YouTube links. And when it comes to score and the other metadata, basically these are public domain and we share them as part of the data set. Uh, the data set has four different versions which roughly correspond to different uh, tasks that I uh, uh, touch during the, uh, the, the, this uh, PhD. And, uh, the, and uh, let's go over the first one is the monophonic etudes where I manually went through all the scores to discard all the samples which include even a single double stop and chord. And at the end, we have 28 hours of monophonic etudes played by 21 players. And these include diverse recording conditions. Second, we have the MIDI transcription data set, where we try to extend the notion of, uh, so we don't really only focus on the monophonic parts, but we extend this into transcription into note events and uh, with, um, with polyphonic cases. So this is uh, 34 hours with MIDI alignments this time. And then we uh, ex try to explore a richer representation of uh, score. And that is music XML, which also includes techniques. So we use this for um, generating these technique labels and, uh, and the learning techniques from these weak labels. And finally, uh, we have this final corpus, which is also on the web. This, is, this version has 443 etudes and 419 pieces, and includes difficulty and technique annotations derived by uh, our violinist collaborator, uh, Lucia. And um, this also includes a web corpus for previewing links, etc. Uh, here you see the comparison of different number of scores in each version. But basically what I want to show here is that at first our focus was not on, on, on collecting a score data set, but through time it became a very important part of the data. And we focused on a richer, tradition, richer uh, representations of score, including music XML. And uh, roughly, as an example, what the data set looks like. So on one side, we have frame-wise labels with smaller data, I can say, because we need the, uh, the, we need the scores to generate these. So uh, scores were present in 491 pieces. And uh, these were aligned with 2,000, more than 2,000 recordings and generated frame-wise labels with notes, speech bands, and, and 10 class technique representations. And uh, on the other side, we have this weekly, um, yeah, with the data set that only includes piecewise weak labels for only like score level. And uh, this includes, again, multiple performances. This time more detailed techniques because our violinist collaborator gave us actually a big and a, a more detailed uh, technique classification. So we use that. And also this includes difficulty for other tasks that can be explored in music education. And uh, so this is how the data set looks like at the end. This also has this hopefully nice web interface that you can uh, explore the performances with different details and also search and uh, yeah, it basically links to the YouTube directly. And uh, I think you get the idea. And it's also a useful source for both researchers, researchers to explore um, if any links is, is uh, removed from the data set or, or for a student which wants to, like, who wants to try and, and listen to the performances for imitating. So in conclusion, uh, here we introduce a data set, which is a comprehensive collection of educational violin recordings and scores, and curated based on the repertoire and curriculum of string pedagogy. Uh, this data set possesses some real world recording conditions, virtuosity and repertoire, and supports multiple research directions thanks to the inclusion of different forms of labels, such as difficulty, techniques, and, and scores, and uh, not only music performance analysis, but also computer-aided music education. So that was the data set. Now we move into more technical parts. Uh, the chapter four deals with pitch estimation. This work, Harmonic Regularized Set Training for Pitch Estimation, this was part of a publication in ISMIR 2022. So for some motivation, why we work on pitch estimation? Uh, it's due to the impor importance of intonation in analyzing, analyzing violin performances. 
Intonation is the accuracy with which a musician hits the intended pitches while playing an instrument. And it's widely regarded as, most as the most important factor in assessing violent performance by many studies. Um, when I say like assessing, it might seem like, oh, okay, there is one ground truth and we can assess to the ground truth. So it's an engineering problem. We can solve it this way. No, it is because there are many tuning systems and this complicates everything. I mean, although it might seem like equal temperament, 12 tone equal temperament that we have in piano right now is the ultimate solution to the tuning and the intonation problems, it is actually not. When you look at the studies about violent performances, you will see that Pythagorean tuning is actually the thing that approximates the violent performance the best. And also we, we have the high use of just intonation. I will play some examples afterwards and you will see the difference, how much the performance can deviate. And these are by professional musicians. Oh, wait, no. Okay. So, um, although, yeah, so as I said before, for, for all this detailed analysis, we need reliable pitch estimation. And on paper, this seems like a solved problem, but let's go through some examples if it is solved. Uh, pitch estimation versus intermediate violin. Here you have this example, Coercitude No. 30, an intermediate performance which includes a string crossing technique. And here you see um, a pitch estimator uh, highly regarded as the industry standard and used in many works priorly and still uh, people use it as, as the state of the art, even including like last year's papers. And uh, here, like let's hear the performance and here we can follow the score. Yeah, so this is the pitch estimate. Um, so it's not very much sold for the intermediate violin or beyond. And also let's see the reliability for intonation analysis. Um, here, this is a very vague explanation. I'm going to give a more detailed explanation afterwards. But basically what we see here is that what happens if, if the player deviates from the equal temperament centers. And here what we see is that the area variance gets very high compared to the player that plays in the equal temperament center. So this just bare, like small example showcasing that it's not suitable for uh, playing outside um, in tune 12 tone equal temperament. So TLDR is pitch estimation is a solved problem for beginning repertoire and when played in tune with respect to equal temperament, but not so much in real world violin performances. And there's still a room for improving pitch estimation for real world music performance analysis. So what we did, we adapted pitch estimation for violent performance analysis in three steps. Uh, first, we trained with the in-domain data, the first version of the data set, the monophonic etudes that I mentioned before, and these were initially unlabeled and uh, 28 hours of recordings with 21 players and diverse recording conditions. And then we also applied microtonal pitch shifts, uh, although the recordings by nature include deviations from 12 tone equal temperament, we added some further robustness, robustness by applying pitch shifts in microtonal uh, range as data augmentation. And finally, uh, as the main technical contribution of this chapter, we use harmonic regularized self-training, as which I can say as a training strategy for unsupervised domain adaptation, and it compares with self-supervised pitch estimation methods, which uh, are, are quite dominant in, 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 the, in the papers nowadays, but this actually improves the uh, supervised uh, pitch estimation. So let me go through what, is, what do I mean by these like self, how many regular self-training? So self-training uh, refers to a learning paradigm that relies on pseudo labels, automatically collected labels. There are prior work that use this for MIR dataset and that is um, applying this teacher-student paradigm. In this paradigm, basically, you train a large network on, a, on labeled data sets and uh, distill this knowledge to a smaller network for mostly this is mainly used for practical applications such as like changing, uh, moving an algorithm from uh, CUDA to, to a mobile. And uh, then uh, the hours is also very close to this, but this is actually much more simplistic. I can say uh, the self-training refers to training the same network, generating pseudo labels, training with them again. So very simplistic and you can easily see that this might lead to overfitting and uh, actually it can. So now that's 
why we have this harmonic regularized part. We apply regularization with, with uh, analysis synthesis method by uh, Xavier Serra. And the uh, application of this for uh, generating automatic F0 labeling uh, was previously explored by Solomon et al. But we, we here, we improve it with novel constraints. The most important being this instrument modeling constraint by what, in which we use the single timber nature of our data set um, but, and, and train an anomaly detector from high confidence pseudo labels and uh, basically iteratively improve as I will, I will show as an example. And the harmonic consistency constraint where we simply use the DSP based um, peak tracker um, in, 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 in addition to the uh, DS, D, D, in addition to the deep learning based one to um, yeah like a, like a ensemble approach I can say. So the approach starts with the, uh, extracting pitch tracks with the CREP model, which um, transforms 20, 16 kilohertz waveforms into pitch classes. Uh, so it, it directly works on, on the, uh, on the uh, raw audio. Uh, but as you see, like the pitch track is not that perfect. So what we do here, we look at this conditional probability. We say, uh, what is the probability of this F0 being correct given the uh, harmonic distribution we expect from a violin performance and this audio uh, harmonic distribution that we observe. If this is higher than a threshold, we let the samples to pass. If not, we don't let them to pass. And uh, this is the recent size version after. Uh, it's removed almost everything, but at least the remainder is correct, which is the most important thing because we can then train these, we, we can then train based on this. Then what we do is we train using these like small samples, but accurate samples, and then, and then extract again, um, apply pitch extraction again with this new model. And as you see, this time we have this white representations, which actually this time see the, uh, um, the jumps. And then when we resynthesize with the same approach again, So this is an iterative process. Like slowly we are improving our data sets and, uh, and the F0 estimator by interacting with each other. Uh, we tested on disjoint data and uh, yeah, basically all of the, the experiments show uh, better performance than the previous uh, trained model, especially in the, in the case of violin, I can say. And uh, also we saw some generalization outside violin. And uh, the, pile, the, the main part I want to highlight here is that I hinted at the beginning an unfortunate auto-tuning effect in training these deep learning based pitch estimators. So um, in short, pitch accuracy should, be, should not be affected by the performance deviation from 12 to equal temperament. So what we expect here is completely flat curves. So this is the ground truth deviation from equal temperament and we accept, expect the accuracy to, sh to remain the same. But as you see here, this is not the case. And this, this is actually something simple, but we have to remind ourselves all the time that like, this, these networks have the tendency to overfit, and if you do not um, care, be careful about these things, uh, it can overfit even more. Uh, ours, ours is still not perfect. It's not completely flat, but it improved, I can say. And we introduced a new problem and a slight solution to the new problem, but it's still a problem. So in conclusion, uh, here in this chapter, we introduce a pseudo-labeling method which allows exploiting unlabeled large-scale music performance analysis collections for pitch estimation and performance analysis. This relies on iterative refinement of pitch labels and also improves the data-driven pitch estimator as a byproduct. So moving on, here basically we dealt with monophonic pitch estimation. What comes next is the more realistic scenario where we need to estimate the pitch in when there is a piano accompaniment. First, again, iterating why. We are, uh, yeah, normally in, in any performance of violin or, or flute or, or clarinet or some most solace instruments, basically, uh, you go to an audition or music exam and you're expected to go with your accompanist. And you are playing a violin sonata. The sonata naturally has piano, although it's not stated in the title. 
So the tracking the target timbre in this setting is of great interest for music performance analysis applications. So what we did in this chapter is basically like the usual approach that people target this is first applying some source separation and then pitch estimation in the um, separated signal. But what we did is, I, th I can say very simple, just uh, estimating the target pitch directly from the input mix. And for this purpose, we created this architecture based on two convolutional streams combined with a transformer afterwards. These convolutional streams, again, come from the CREP uh, pitch estimator. And then uh, we have this transformer modules which um, for, for the information flow between them and then uh, estimating the violin pitch. The most important thing here I can say is training with synthetic audio mixes, the random mixes, the cacophony uh, for generating, for, 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 for the training basically. This, this is based on for each sample of the batch. Oh, maybe I didn't do it so well. Well, anyway, so for each sample of the batch basically, we apply different SNR level to the, by, by mixing these violin piano stems and train for target, for, for, uh, train for predicting the violin pitch. And we use this SNR as the control parameter throughout our experiments. And the, the F0 labels that we use are, again, the ones automatically generated from the previous chapter. And uh, using this paradigm, we tested on real uh, data sets which are disjoint from our train sets. These are real violin recordings, real violin piano recordings from MusicNet and medley DB data sets. Um, for bass lines, we uh, compared with conventional pitch estimators, these five pitch estimators, after music source separation, and uh, music source separation or different input conditions, basically. We, we will also show, like here, this is the box plot comparing different input conditions for Beethoven violin piano sonatas from MusicNet, and uh, it might look very untidy at first, but let's go one by one, like at first we have this raw audio input, uh, ours performs uh, good on raw audio, but this is normal, I mean they are not expected to perform good on raw audio, this is just to show that this is what happens in, when we uh, put raw audio. And then we have open and mixed based uh, source separation models, the first two are previous uh, work um, on violin piano source separation, and the last one is the one we trained using our um, violin piano stems, or, or our violin etudes plus uh, maestro data set, the same data sets as the tape. And as you see, like our version improved uh, the previous uh, violin piano source separation. And then we have this splitter based one, where the first one is the uh, splitter is a very uh, highly used uh, uh, conventional uh, source separation model. The, the most widely used one is this five stem, the, the pre-trained one, where, which is for, um, popular music, and then we have piano concertos by Yit Janazar and Maynard Miller, and then we have our version uh, trained using the same data set. As you see, like this is very simple, and as you expect, we have this, as training data gets closer to the domain, we have uh, higher accuracies, as you expect. But overall, the best performing one for the um, standard um, pitch estimators is this uh, splitter hours, but some interesting uh, result from these uh, experiments was that our model performed the best on raw audio and actually source separation degraded its performance sometimes a lot, sometimes just a tiny bit. And so moving on, we used uh, this version with splitter hours uh, and, and we fed that to, to the pitch estimators because it was the best performing one. And we compare against that in these two data sets and uh, we show that uh, tape on raw audio outperforms the two stage methods. And uh, here we have an ablation study because here we introduce basically two improvements. One is this um, utilization of a larger window and the other is um, the synthetic mixing strategy. Basically uh, what happens if we use this large window or make it identical to the, to the CREP model, for example. And we see that we, uh, the large window actually improves by like uh, 5%, but the biggest improvement actually comes from the synthetic training uh, or, or random mixing based training. And uh, one more interesting thing, again, going back to the real life. Uh, in, so before I had the opportunity to check some real music exam uh, recordings, and uh, I saw, for example, for in, in the case of some 
violin uh, performances, I saw that people put the microphone in, in, a, in a good uh, in a, um, music exam that they want to get a, a, a certificate. They put the microphone on top of the piano, and the, the, uh, basically the microphone and, and camera jumps together with the piano. So we expect these behavior from people. So we don't expect the uh, best engineering conditions to happen from here. And uh, basically to study conditions like this for, for the violin piano energies, we use SNR. I know it's simple, but this is what we could do. Uh, basically, when SNR le levels are negative, we are closer to piano energy. Imagine that it's closer to, a microphone is closer to the piano. So basically, we show that our improvement is actually bigger when the energy, piano energy is bigger than the violin energy. So, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna play this one, but just, uh, so here, I don't have the ground truth labels, but here you can see that when the microphone is in front of the violin, the uh, crap and, and our model uh, predicts almost identical, so they're good both. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the microphone is in front of the piano, here, our model still um, attends to the violin pitch and the other is expectedly attends to the piano. Mm -hmm. Rather, I'm, I want to play this, uh, some good music. And here is our model sonified with uh, sinusoid. You get the idea, I think. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we showed that tra trained on random mixes outperform the conventional pipeline of source separation and pitch estimation in real life violin piano duets. And we think this is an important step towards end-to-end -to -end music performance analysis. So just a quick reminder, what did until now is again monophonic pitch estimation. Uh, normal condition and then when there's a piano, but now, moving on, we delve into transcription of violin performances, including polyphonic cases. Uh, this is a work uh, published in Izmir 2023. So with high resolution here, we mean 5.8 milliseconds in time and 10 cents in frequency. Hopefully, you're uh, already convinced that these resolutions are needed for music performance analysis and realistic synthesis of the violin music. And weak labels, we mean learning from unaligned pairs of YouTube recordings and, and scores collected from the web. We need this because, again, as I mentioned before, we do not have high quality data sets such as Maestro for the violin performances. So let's start with the architecture. It is similar to the previous one with the double convolutional heads at the bottom. Uh, we convert raw audio in 44 kilohertz into onset, offset, frame, and F0 representations using a combination of convolutional and conformer networks. First, we have the multi-resolution duplex CNNs modified from CREP model. Then this is followed by multiple conformer block. Conformer is a state-of-the-art um, uh, speech recognition model. It is essentially cascaded convolution and transformer layers, and it's suitable for general audio processing, such as transcription. So this architecture is then followed by two-stage post-processing, uh, which covers these vector representations into MIDI events. First, we form the semitone level MIDI events from onset, offset, and frames. For this, we use the, an existing method with high speed from the basic pitch model from Rachel. And this model actually has uh, something very unique and very important for our applications. And it is the representation of pitch bands. And we get this idea and we improve it a, lot, a bit, I think. A lot, maybe. <laughs> and uh, for finer pitch band tracking, 
by um, first using a higher resolution in terms of frequency, and then um, basically you, you, utilizing VTRB pitch tracking within the constraint regions that correspond to the node event. For this model, we trained it using the version two of the dataset, violin MIDI uh, transcription dataset. It consists of 120 scores and there are 34 hours of YouTube recordings. But these scores and performances actually come from different sources, so they're not aligned, and this is our duty to align with using weak supervision. Uh, where we took an expectation maximization approach to train the model using these pairs. It consists of four stages. First, we generate some fuzzy labels by conventional audio score alignment from Sync Toolbox. Um, then uh, we train the network with these labels. Then create finer alignments using the new model's features. And finally, train on this data until convergence. So it is, it's like a very old school HMM GMM, which is generally used in speech processing uh, applications and apply to our context where the labels are scarce. And we, apply, we use tests on, on two proxy tasks, tasks, transcription and pitch estimation. With transcription, I mean 12-20 uh, to cool temperament transcription, which is the um, standard uh, setting that researchers generally use for evaluation. And tested on two data sets, URMP and Bahten. And basically the results show uh, state of the art performance under both uh, settings. And uh, my favorite part, examples. I'd like to show example, some examples of how the model encodes the performance details inside the MIDI files. Here you see a passage from a famous Paganini Caprice performed by three great violinists. But because the violin is fretless, even these famous musicians disagree in their choice of the third intervals. So let's hear these subtle differences in the encoded MIDI. Let's hear, let's hear. This was the best part. So this is from Midori, then from Itzhak Perlman, and Julia Fisher. Again, these are all encoded from the MIDI. So I, I, I think all of you can hear the differences and uh, even the performance uh, from, from professional, highly uh, skilled performance disagree in their choices here. And uh, lastly, the, the details of other music traditions such as Makam music can also be preserved thanks to the pitch band representations. Let's hear how the Kurdi taksim was transcribed into MIDI. So yeah, here we introduced a transcription model with high precision pitch band estimation, uh, which was learned from piecewise weak labels. We also use this as a tool for violin performance analysis. In the uh, intonation um, analysis of the, one second, intonation analysis in the context of violin education, the master thesis by Maria Perez. In this uh, thesis, we used this for, for the analysis of violin performances, and she found that the dominant, the fifth and the subdominant fourth grades aligns with 12 tonical temperament, while the median, the third grade, and leading tone, the seventh, being about five cents sharper than the 12 tonical temperament. So this aligns well with the previous findings in other research. So uh, just to sum up again, uh, monophonic pitch estimation, monophonic pitch estimation, but under polyphonic setting. Uh, here, um, uh, transcription with uh, pitch band estimation. Now we come to the point where we can um, do, do more towards accurate representation of violent performances, and that goes from instrument playing technique detection. Um, so this is an extension of transcription in my viewpoint. Uh, this is mainly useful for expressive performance analysis, but also it's very useful, and I think it's much more useful than in the educational settings. I mean, all my teachers were giving me background, giving me the feedback based on techniques. And giving teacher-like feedback actually goes from uh, accurately detecting the techniques from recordings or from teacher performances. So this approach, I think, is uh, some step towards educational recommendation systems where your, your AI assistant can give you your next piece based on what you can play. So.
So this approach uh, relies on some assumptions, of course, as with everything. First, uh, the tradition of notating uh, playing techniques on top of the score, which actually emerged uh, very dominantly after, um, after the uh, late Romantic period. And uh, another assumption is um, believe in that expert performances, these teacher performances in the data set, are going to be faithful to the score in the execution of these. But actually, I think this is this is meaningful because these are teaching performances and they are made to, to, for the students to imitate, so they should be. And um, again, our method relies on annotation transfer from score to recordings uh, for the techniques, uh, five right-hand techniques, legato, detache, accent, staccato, and pizzicato, and five right-hand techniques, harmonics, trills, ornaments, double stops, and chords. Uh, and uh, we do it in two steps. First, uh, symbolic music processing. Although it seems easy, it is not. It is really not. And uh, especially the music XML format, I have to, maybe I shouldn't be too much pessimistic. OK, uh, symbolic music processing. And then audio score alignment for transferring the labels from scores to audio recordings. The symbolic music processing is uh, easy for some um, uh, articulations and expressions such as note level articulations. These are easy because they, they're contained in the part related to the note event. These are articulations, some technical elements, ornaments, and grace notes. Then we have slurs, a bit more complex. These span multiple notes, like, uh, but they are close to the tie, and uh, so the slur, and the, there, there are slurs within slurs, so it's a bit more complicated. And one challenge here is that we try to use Music 21 for processing music XML files, but unfortunately, when it comes to the repetition signs, it, didn't, it doesn't really have that functionality to expand the, the, these uh, details. So we had to build our own uh, music XML processing method. And then we have uh, textual expressions inside the score. Basically, this happens a lot in the context where you have some notes played with pizzicato, and then you change, you hold the bow again, and, and play them with arco. Uh, these are, again, easy, and they affect the sequence, like uh, after the note events after that expression. And there are also cases where the composers write, OK, so this thing is completely played with martelet, and then it's written at the beginning, and then we just extend this annotation to, to, the, to encompass the whole performance. But there are cases where the life is hard. Textual, for example, te techniques annotated only at the beginning. In some cases, some composers just write it here. And when you look at all the editions, like they, they're only here. But when you look at the performances, they play the same technique everywhere. So I manually went over to scores, like 400, more than 200 scores, to correct them one by one. And there are Simile and Sege events. These, these represent like continuation patterns, like these. But what is hard here is that you can't really say what is to be continued. I mean, there might be, for example, the dynamics pattern, and it says like continue this pattern. But this requires a higher level of intelligence, which we couldn't have at this point, and uh, for the automatization of this process. So I did it manually. And then there are annotations lost in conversion. For example, for annotating artificial harmonics, you annotate it with two notes. One like signifying where you should put your first finger and then the second finger, barely touching to create the artificial harmonic. But this is most often understood as a chord event. So again, manual editions here, or like there are cases where there are two voices and one, um, one uh, textual expression is for one, the other is for the other. And Identifying which voice is which, again, it's, it requires a higher intelligence that we couldn't automatize yet. So at the end, uh, after this process, we end up with representations, colorful representations like these. And uh, first, we have these weak annotations by our violinist collaborators for cross-check uh, to make sure that the labels are correct. And then we have measured numbers again to compare with the score, again, to ensure the correctness. Then we have these playing techniques are shown with color codes. We considered like 10 uh, playing techniques, five per each hand, and then, well, actually more, but then I use the five at the end. And uh, again, these color codes, again, put on, on top of the midi roll to blend in with the um, note events, basically pitches, and this is less cluttered example. 
Here we have uh, the dominant techniques, trills and legato, and easily see, you can easily see them, follow them from the notes. And uh, after we get these representations, now uh, we can utilize some weak supervision techniques for alignment and transferring this information into recordings. Yeah, this is based on the transcription features that I explained in the previous chapter. So we align using these features and then what, why do we use transcription for this purpose? The main, a good reason is handling the repeat signs. So most often you have one score with multiple repeat signs and uh, no one plays them as it is written. People have their own repetition patterns, uh, even in classical music. So we have to handle this situation. And we use uh, basically edit distance, uh, Levenstein distance, with transcription for automatically expanding these events. And uh, as you can see, it's correctly expanded here and uh, here with the two repetitions. So these pseudo labels agree. And then we apply some EM boundary refinement procedure where we um, again improve these onsets and offset representations by searching the peaks around uh, the node events. Basically, this is very old school DSP model that follows from Maman and Bermano, which is a great work. And uh, uh, manual verification, then we have this manual verification. For example, in this one, the pseudo labels doesn't agree, so the repeat, repeat sign didn't um, open correctly. As you see, like the um, red dots, which represent the pseudo labels for pitch, doesn't uh, align well with the alignment, the, the uh, black ones. So in this case, we manually discard the sample. So having these visual tools helps us a lot in debugging or, or refining the data set. And uh, so this is the end result um, after uh, alignment. Again, you see these few labels and the frame-wise uh, labels, etc. And we use these representations. Finally, we came at that point that we can apply these like cool deep learning uh, for, for learning our uh, representation. Our <laughs> Uh, main uh, problem, and this follows from Lee et al. Uh, frame level multi label playing technique detection using multi scale network and self attention mechanism from 2023. But as I said before, what we are interested in here is how to blend this with transcription. So instead of using the uh, standard CQT network, uh, CQT input, uh, which is the DSP based uh, um, pitch representation. We use the same network with different input conditions. These are uh, different layers from the pre-trained network that I showed before. So this is a transcription network where you can imagine that this A and B, this is very close to the raw audio. And then there is a hierarchy where we get closer to the transcription. And wh what I'm after here is to see what techniques are co related to uh, transcription more so that like, uh, we, can, we can find the spot where to blend these uh, two representations better. And uh, in our experiments, we, show, we found that unfortunately, our, uh, yeah, we saw some improvement compared to the CQT-based model, which is something at least, but the improvement is very minuscule. And uh, actually going towards the, the uh, connecting more heads towards the transcription actually didn't improve the performance much. So further work should target better parameter sharing between transcription and technique detection. And uh, here we also studied, like, this is just a raw example. What are these different connections and what do they represent in terms of these techniques? And, and what we found is that legato, detache, harmonics, and double, harmonics, double steps, and chords are closer to the raw audio. So they get better when we connect them to the raw audio. Then accents and staccatos are better in the middle, and trills and ornaments are at the top. And unfortunately, pizzicato is zero, zero, and zero. So I'm not so happy about this. And future work, I think, should definitely improve pizzicato detection using synthetic data, which we didn't use. And normally, I, don't, I personally don't consider synthetic data as a good approach for solving these sort of problems. But if we have these situations, I mean, of course, we should use uh, synthetic data, which we didn't use. So in this chapter, we use uh, music XML. We, uh, created a music XML label transfer method for playing technique detection. Good accuracies for common techniques such as legato can be obtained. And uh, this is a step towards uh, extended transcription with playing technique detection. 
So we're almost at the end. So just to summarize, in this thesis, we have two main contributions. We targeted the scarcity of in-domain data by introducing a data set representing practical needs of music performance analysis. This belongs to chapter three. And then we target the difficulty of labeling using meekly supervised training strategies for core music performance analysis tasks. And uh, we've, in chapter four, we introduce a harmonic regularized self-training method for unsupervised domain adaptation, let's say, for, for training with unlabeled data sets and, and adapting to uh, performance analysis setting. Then in the second chapter, the, the chapter five, uh, with timber where pitch estimation, we extended this uh, pitch estimation into the polyphonic context where we are targeting the uh, specific uh, pitch estimation of one instrument in the, in the setting. And in chapter six, uh, we introduced a transcription model with uh, pitch band representations with no uh, onset offset events. And in chapter seven, we did some uh, initial work towards uh, blending transcription with uh, playing technique detection for an end-to-end -end, uh, approach towards music performance analysis. So there, of course, remains a lot of feature work. The first one is uh, we desperately need a virtuoso set with manual labels because uh, the, the, the examples that I showed you, uh, they are not quite visible when you look at the, the uh, actual um, data. Although, yeah, it, it outperforms the previous settings, but the data sets are not as, as challenging as required for actual music performance analysis applications. So an actual uh, virtuoso test data set with manual labels with actually require a lot of uh, uh, investment is needed and use of synthesizer for rare, rare techniques is needed again and uh, what is pending to me the most important thing is end-to-end -end music performance analysis approach that unites all the dimensions of analysis in a single network and uh, this also should include dynamics and loudness modules we did something towards this with the uh, Jyoti in uh, her uh, Ismir publication, which will be presented next month. And uh, yeah, that concludes my thesis. Thank you. <laughs>